Well, Nancy, it's lovely to have you here um, with us um, in Auckland, New Zealand, and the time that you've been with us at the conference, and it's just, well, it's been great to hear what you've been, um, to what you've given to us. And so I'd like to really take this opportunity to have a talk with you and, and perhaps ask you some questions yeah. about um, your work and, and your life and um, of a, sometimes a bit of a personal nature. So maybe we'll kick straight into that. Sure. And, and get off with this question is that I understand that you grew up as a Southern Baptist and Indeed. that your father was a pastor yeah. in this tradition. And then um, I also understand that in the 1990s you wrote a book called uh, Baptist Battles, where you documented the, that the Southern Baptist denomination and their internal struggles, and you tell the story of the Baptist reversal from moderate to a fundamentalist outlook, and then speculate on the future of the denomination. I wonder, could you reflect a little on that journey, yeah. perhaps with a reference yeah. to your own sense of identity, yeah. belonging, and struggle, and yeah. the battle that took place for you? You know, when I was getting close to the end of writing that book, I said to my husband, you know, I hope I never again write a book over which I shed so many tears. Mm. Uh, I didn't really realize as I was launching into the project how much all of the research was going to be something that would become as personal as, as it certainly was. I, I grew up as a Southern Baptist and what I began to realize was that what was happening was a transformation of many of, of the institutions that had been part of sort of my the architecture of my worldview um, as I was growing up. You know, these were the the people who headed these institutions were the heroes and heroines. The this was the, this was just the world I lived in, and I was watching as those institutions were being fundamentally transformed and many of the people who were uh, were the leaders and who'd been my heroes and heroines were the people who were being pushed out and, and hurt in, in very significant ways. And so at, at that level, it was really difficult to write that story. But there was also a sense in which uh, one of the things that happened to me in the process was I realized that I didn't really have a stake in either side in this controversy. At, at some point, the way the moderate political party mm. uh, within the denomination had construed itself, um, it really wasn't, it didn't speak for me in some ways any more than the fundamentalist party did. Because the, the moderate leaders in the denomination had basically decided they were willing to do anything to keep the denomination uh, in intact and, and under their control, basically. And they were willing to sacrifice any of the more progressive causes um, in order to compromise, to try to keep uh, things under their control. And I just, that wasn't my agenda either. So. You know, part of what happened to me in the process of doing the analysis and writing the book was recognizing that there wasn't a place for me uh, in that battle anymore. And I was so fortunate that I was a member of this wonderful Baptist church in Atlanta. You know, good old Baptist polity. It's all about the local church, <laughs> you know. And this, this local church, Oakhurst Baptist Church in Decatur, was a place where I could be absolutely both at home and challenged and, and be a Baptist. Um, and, you know, stayed Baptist for a very long time. Uh, Jimmy Carter used to say that, Jimmy Carter, the former president yes, yes, yes. Of, of, the, of the U.S., but also a Southern Baptist, uh, used to talk about his little church's uh, affiliation with the denomination and how people would go off and, and go to the annual convention and they'd pass all these resolutions and then he'd go home to his local church and they'd just overturn them all the yeah, next Sunday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we were very fortunate, but of course you can't entirely escape it. No. And eventually, um, after we had actually moved away, but uh, pretty soon after we moved away, our local church indicator was uh, expelled really? from the Baptist yeah. Convention in Georgia. Mm. And so I've had a it's pretty, a lot of pain there for you. Yeah, it's it? a lot of pain. Yeah. And but That's, I understand yeah. also. I mean, you don't go to a Southern Baptist church now. Uh, but, no, but you're still connected. <laughs> well, 
even while we were still in Atlanta, that church uh, became duly aligned with the American Baptist churches okay. um, and mm -hmm. the Southern Baptist Convention. They decided they weren't going to just leave the Southern Baptists. We wanted mm -hmm. to have them kick mm -hmm. us out, which they, you know, obliged and did. Uh, but so I already had a connection with the American mm -hmm. Baptist churches, right. and when we moved into yeah. New England, yeah. Yeah. you know, that was a natural connection okay. Okay. Uh, to make. Uh, just for a variety of reasons, I'm not attending a Baptist church right yeah. now, but I do still maintain my connection. That's, that's your home. That's my yeah. home. And yeah. just in relation to that, how, yeah. did, how did your work as a sociologist affect you uh, and affect your understanding of, of what happens in congregations? So all mm -hmm. this happens and you're going to yourself, well, look what's happening in my own context where my own faith <laughs> community is. I mean, yeah, it, it does become a little of a busman's holiday where yeah. it's very difficult to, uh, to go into any congregation mm. and completely mm. turn off mm. my uh, mm. observation. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Sometimes I want to take field yeah. notes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I came into studying mm. congregations because, uh, because I'm a PK, a mm. pastor's mm. kid. I grew up observing congregations whether I wanted to or not. Mm. Uh, I grew up having to move from one congregation mm. to another and therefore having mm. to mm. You know, see the differences and notice mm. the culture mm. and mm. You know, mm. kind of learn mm. that as mm. I was going along. So I, I think I come by studying congregations kind of naturally mm. uh, as both a PK and a Baptist mm. who mm. sees mm. congregations as, as really important. but. Entering the field of congregational studies was kind of an accident mm. because my first book was actually about fundamentalism mm. uh, as a movement. And so, if you want to study fundamentalism, there's nothing more radically independent and local than fundamentalist mm. congregations. And so, you know, you, the okay. place to study it is in a mm. congregation. Mm. Yeah. So I spent a year, you know, in this congregation interviewing people and observing what was going on and wrote this book called Bible Believers. And soon after the book came out, people who think of themselves as congregational studies people mm -hmm. invited me to come and talk to them. And their first question was, so when did you decide to study congregations? I said, didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I was studying yeah. fundamentalism mm -hmm. and I studied it in a congregation. Mm -hmm. But very soon thereafter they sort of seduced me into, <laughs> 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 yeah. into really uh, concentrating on mm -hmm. studying congregations. So in one sense, growing up in a, a, as a PK, pastor's kid, you, yeah. you have this intuitive sense of, of life in the congregation. Yeah. It's all yeah. this dynamics and, yeah. and aspects to that. Um, well, you've answered my question in terms of what led you into congregational yeah. studies. <laughs> so let's take another tack and ask yes. you something a little kind of maybe personal and, mm -hmm. and relates to a little piece of history that we mm. caught at an international level. And that is, I understand you worked at, uh, at Hartford in 2001, mm -hmm. um, where there was a Center for Islamic Studies and mm -hmm. Christian Relations. Mm -hmm. Now. The question is that when the tragic events of 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. what impact did that have on Har the Harford community that you were yeah. part of? Yeah. Well, that day, of course, was a horrendous day for everybody. Um, and Hartford Seminary is a very interesting place, and I loved working there for the eight years I was there. And one of the things I loved about it was that the Center for uh, Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations was very much a part of the seminary, had been since the 1890s. This wasn't some you know, newfangled mm. thing that mm. Hartford mm. Uh, started doing recently. So I had a number of Muslim colleagues and Muslim students. And so when 9-11 happened, we immediately knew that our Muslim colleagues were going to be incredibly affected by this, and that there were going to be there were going to be ramifications and difficulties for them as Muslims in American society. And unfortunately, they're certainly not on our immediate colleagues, but Muslims in the U.S. suffered enormously in those days. So. The fact that we were part of a community where there already was a conversation between Muslims and Christians and a consciousness also of, of having Jews as part of that conversation meant that we could easily draw leaders together mm. uh, rather quickly and in fact by that evening uh, had put together an interfaith mm. service mm. in which Muslims, Jews and Christians were coming together mm 
to, to pray together, to pray for peace. Uh, we had, we'd figured out ways to pray together uh, mm. as a community, mm. which was really mm. wonderful. And, um, you know, the newspapers were there and a couple of TV cameras were there, and so it became at least a bit of a kind of public um, demonstration mm. of the fact that it was possible for people from different parts of the world, from different mm. religious traditions, to come together and, and see this as a, a time to draw together mm -hmm. rather than being mm -hmm. torn apart. Did that have any in the low, and I mean, I don't know the geography of Har Hartford or <laughs> the, the area it's in, um, but did it have any effect in terms of congregations around here that people look to say, wow, well, look what's mm -hmm. happening there. Mm -hmm. Is that a cue mm -hmm. for us to begin mm -hmm. to talk to our neighbors? And yeah, it, Hartford Seminary is very active in doing various kinds of programming mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, encourage congregations mm -hmm. to engage mm -hmm. in this kind of mm -hmm. dialogue across mm -hmm. faith lines. Mm -hmm. and. So there'll be both events at the seminary and workshops that go out into the churches and so forth. So um, I think it really is a very positive influence on the religious communities there in, in the region. Okay. Um, what's been a high point of your career? And I've got another question to follow this one, but when you look over, I mean, it's a long yeah. period of time now and you've... Um, yeah. yeah. You know, this, this is a, an interesting story about the way my scholarship and my, mm -hmm. uh, my faith life mm -hmm. uh, come together. Um, as I finished writing that book on the Baptists, mm -hmm. that period of time was one in which the, there, there were new organizations starting mm -hmm. to be formed. Uh, there were a lot of people like me who were discovering that they really didn't have a stake anymore in continuing to fight the battles, that they were ready to launch out and do some new things. And in literally in the summer that my book came out, um, a new group was called together that was originally going to be just a sort of a small consultation of you know, 50 people sort of getting together in a hotel conference room and talking about where do we go from here. And it turned into about 1,500 people showed up. Um, and they decided that the following um, May, they would convene a, an actual sort of a convention, a convocation, and invite people to come and think about starting some sort of new movement. And I got put on the coordinating group for this and was invited to actually give a talk the opening night of this uh, meeting. So that opening night, you know, I put together a talk that really built out of what I'd learned about, uh, about the denomination and about what the possibilities for the future were, you know, sort of had my sociological thinking cap on, but also very much speaking as a Baptist mm. to this group of Baptists. And, had the opportunity to stand in front of 6,000 people in a big mm. arena mm. and have them stand at the end of what I had to mm. say and mm. respond incredibly mm. positively. Mm. There was an editorial in the Atlanta Constitution mm. the next mm. day about how this mm. was sort of a launching movement, mm. the moment for mm. this mm. movement. Mm. And to have that incredible opportunity mm to mm. speak to those people, to mm. give voice to a moment mm. out of both my faith and my research. So it's really was, kind of convergence of yeah. these things, of a deep sense of your own yeah. experience coming yeah. together with you. So it in was. terms of that, I mean, you might have already alluded to it, what, yeah. what continues to be a struggle for you in relation to your work and yeah. faith? Yeah. Well, I think I'm so committed to how important congregations mm. are. And probably the biggest struggle is just recognizing how um, how feeble many congregations mm, are, mm, mm. Uh, how deeply flawed many congregations <laughs> are, uh, that it's not the perfect world mm, I wish yeah. it were, mm. uh, and just really continuing to struggle mm. with how can I use my sociological mm, gifts mm, mm. to to make a difference mm. uh, in mm. congregational life. Mm. Mm. Well, we certainly, even here at that's Laidlaw, we use your material, so yeah. you're impacting a lot of what I think you that's, realize across the world, which, which is wonderful. It's what every yeah, person like yourself would like to yeah. hear, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, 
your early work was in congregational studies, mm -hmm. and I note um, through this conference and in what you've been saying, and the latest book is titled Religion Everyday Life. This mm -hmm. is a change. Why the change, and uh -huh. what happened to cause this shift? Yeah. Well, the religion in everyday life question is for me a question that arose out of the the really big theoretical debates in my mm. discipline. Mm. So this this really mm. came out of, you know, I've been in this discipline for a while now and I'm really tired of the way it gets framed mm. um, in the larger intellectual mm. conversation. And so I think there are some things to be asked mm. that can really only be asked if you ask mm. at the level of how religion mm. is a part or not a part of people's everyday lives. The project initially was intended really to be at that kind of individual level. You know, how are individual people doing this, this faith work if they're doing it at all? What I quickly discovered in analyzing the data was that I can't get away from congregations, no. that the difference between people who are a part of a congregation and people who aren't was just so enormous mm -hmm. that one of the things that's come out of the study is my wanting to say back to people, if you, if you care about mm -hmm. the presence of religion in mm -hmm. beyond the four walls of the church, mm -hmm. if you care about religion in everyday life, mm -hmm. you've got to care about what happens inside the four walls of the church. Yeah, and of course participation and story has come out in, in your yeah. in your age, right? Yeah. Uh, over the last couple of days. Um, one last question uh, for those that are, will be watching this, no doubt, which will be pastors and church leaders. What do you think is one of the most important challenges facing congregational leaders mm -hmm. and pastors today? And if you were to offer one piece of advice, which this is a big ask, <laughs> what might that be? Well, I'm going to give you the one piece of, of quick advice, and that is uh, find places to meet people who might not want to come through the doors of the church and find ways to invite them to tell you about what matters in their lives. And when you do that, you're likely to hear more than you, you're likely to get an earful, mm. uh, but you're also likely to open up doors mm. through which conversations can, can be undertaken that can carry over perhaps into a more lasting kind of set of relationships with the community. Mm. Great, wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. You're it's welcome. been lovely to have you and great yes. to talk with you. Thank you very much. Okay.